Well, welcome to a slightly different Uncommon podcast. So for the last month or so, my wife and I have been battling COVID. Uh, still at the tail end of that, both have tested negative, but Joshua and his wife uh, caught the flu, emphysema, the heebie-jeebies, whatever it was. And so he is working from home the last couple of weeks. So we're going to do our podcast um, via Zoom, you know, like in the COVID years, <laughs> instead of being side by side. <clears throat> Probably next week, we'll pick this up and we'll do uh, future ones again. But we figured, why let this hold us back? Let's do this since we did one right before the holidays uh, on mental health, because we're kind of in that mental health awareness month. And that seems to have been very popular. So we didn't want to take and lose the momentum. And we had a second podcast already kind of written. And so we'll be doing that today. So uh, welcome to the show. I am TJ. This is Joshua. And we are Uncommon. So uh, the topic for today is from shadows to light, navigating men's mental health journey mm -hmm. now, when we first started doing this uh i didn't even know january was mental health month until we started doing research end of last year and when we put that put this out here um we saw a lot of engagement around this topic and so the more we kind of dig into this topic we more we see that everybody either struggles with or knows someone in their family or friends that struggle with a little bit of mental health. Right. And so we're talking about this from a men's standpoint as well as a faith standpoint. And so um, before we get into that, know that I will try to mute my coughs as much as possible. Just like that one. Okay, so uh, our first segment, uh, we have three segments in this podcast. We're doing a little bit longer. Um, overcoming barriers to mental health care for men. And so you kind of see that many men face unique barriers that prevent them from seeking mental health care. And so, Josh, what do you think are some of the the biggest things that stop men from tr seeking mental health care i know from the guys that i've, I've been exposed to over my lifetime a lot later in college years is where it kind of took took shape um a lot of them felt like it was almost like a sign of weakness um sure. guys i knew that were like you know oh no i'm fine i'm a dude i i need to be able to handle myself without going to go see a shrink what am i crazy right. and i think you can see that as a little bit of remnants of the previous generations prior to this where before the last you know decade two decades that the idea of seeing a therapist or seeking mental health um stances on trying to figure out some good pro 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 productive ways to handle that on your end were seen as weakness or crazy or well i'm not doing that because the, I, I know what's best for me and I know as a dude, I bottle those emotions down and then I don't talk about them and then I die and then that's how it goes kind of thing. <laughs> um, so I think it's it's a lot of that. I think a lot of like weakness because there's so much of a societal pressure of as a man, you need to be this rock solid figure in the household. And when that's the case, a lot of times you, if you're the rock, where do you go to for solace? But for when everyone comes to you for solace, how do you handle that? Sure. And so a lot, of, a lot of it's probably bred out of necessity of the guys realizing, well, I don't have anyone I can go to, but everyone comes to me, so I need to do something about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you can see in, in more recent years, that stigma has shifted quite a bit, which is good. I think uh, there's a lot of guys that, whether it's you know, AA, group meetings, Bible study, counseling, all that kind of stuff has become a lot more of the cultural norm, which is good, just because we've talked about this a lot on the podcast about guys need to have mentors and mentorees in their lives to be able to talk through sure. the next stage of life and then talk those in the previous stage of life to kind of 
work through those emotional and mental pitfalls we all go through, sure. depending on, you know, you first kid, just married, maybe first week in college, that kind of thing. So I think it's, it's progressing better nowadays, especially, but a lot of guys probably really, I know, I know a lot of guys that I knew in college still struggled with the idea of talking through their feelings and mental health issues and just owning that shortcoming as a guy. Yeah, it's funny is that when we're doing research on this here, you know, you know, you think back and you see those those movies of people in school, uh, maybe younger, maybe junior high kind of thing. There's so much peer pressure, you know, we get dressed, we get talk, we look, whatever kind of thing. You know, though that peer pressure uh, probably never really goes away as you get to be an adult. You always think, well, someone is looking at me and passing judgment on that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, whether it is uh, correct or not, I think people still struggle with the thought of what is someone going to think if I do seek mental health uh, treatment, therapy, uh, medication, um, a person I tell that my, you know, I, I struggle with bipolar disorder, whatever the thing is. Um, because they may not understand that, um, I want to call it, you know, um, syndrome. They have like preconceived notions of, oh, well, I didn't know you were crazy. Yeah. You know, and so I think also you see issues from a generational standpoint. When I was young, I mean, everything wasn't diagnosed. I mean, every, now it looks like everything is diagnosed. You know, you, you have fear of doorknobs. It's a, a, a disorder. Let's treat that with some medication and therapy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when I was young, I'm sure they had rampant mental health issues, just undiagnosed. Yeah. So you have that extreme. Uh, I'm, I'm Gen X proud to say I am Gen X. Thank <laughs> you, Lord, for being Gen X. Um, you have ranges from boomers to Zs that, you know, uh, approach mental health much differently. Yeah. And so uh, it, it's important for us to, especially the older generations, uh, to be aware that it's because you may have not got, got diagnosed when you were younger, doesn't mean you can't still today. And for the younger generations, you're not like Charlie Brown. You don't have every phobia, right? Yeah. Every phobia. So somewhere in the middle of that is usually where everybody exists. And yeah. so uh, some of the, the barriers, um, you know, strategies for men to overcome these barriers include education on mental health, mm -hmm. finding an old the guy um, that you can kind of talk to about it, maybe even someone who can offer some therapy. Um, you know, there are groups on everything. There's groups. I just joined a group on, on Facebook for all the things that are missing that used to be there in New Orleans. <laughs> Born and raised in New Orleans. And so it goes through all the things that makes me feel really old, seeing all the things that my childhood are now gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and also finding some role models and maybe read some books um, about men who have successfully navigated some of these kind of barriers. Um, have you ever seen any books or have you ever read anything that stood out to you from uh, approaching just mental health or just um, a good personality book? I just finished uh, listening to Atlas of the Heart. Um, that was a very, very good book about emotional maturity, mm -hmm. going through just like the human condition about emotions and how to like almost uh, like recognize the different kinds of emotions and figuring out, you know, for the negative ones, how to get out of that spiral, the difference between maybe despair or stress and that kind of stuff. I I find that the more you talk and learn about this kind of stuff and you grow that vocabulary sure. about when we talk about mental health, it helps when we, we can discuss it in a more 
neutral setting instead of such hostility or flippancy yeah. on both sides of that. Sure. You know, like you said, previous generations look at that and go, well, everyone has something, they're all weak. What is the world coming to? And then new generations like, how dare you talk down to me? These are conditions I have. I'm trying to get fixed or trying to get you know, into a, a stable position. And it's just, there's no common vocabulary across those generations. Like, I mean, I, I'm sure with you growing up with your dad, you probably never had conversations about what mental health looked like as a you know faith-based man. And I know a lot of guys in college that didn't have conversations like that with their, their dads or other guys in their groups. So I think besides the book, just having that conversation with your children or even friends, just so they know one, that it's a safe environment sure. and two, that you can work on that vocabulary and how you can discuss that in a, you know, a way that shows grace and love in that conversation and to show support because it, pretending it's not there or sweeping it under the rug or bottling it down is probably the worst decision because it's going to affect you in different areas of your life of snapping at your wife you know, getting angry at work throwing things you know seeking uh, solace in other ways alcohol drugs whatever the case may be and so i think it, the worst thing you can do is just not address it at all i think that's awesome. what i've learned a lot over the last years about reading books about emotional maturity, spiritual maturity, and then the like. So that that's really kind of what I've been, as we kind of like dug into this information and and wrote through this, um, these stats and whatnot, that that's definitely what I've taken away from it. How I found out that uh, my dad had bipolar was kind of like, did he just throw the TV through the front window? <laughs> oh, okay. He has bipolar. Okay. I got you. We didn't know what it was called. That's how sometimes my generation found out that <clears throat> a mental disorder ran through, maybe through the family, undiagnosed, untreated, that type of thing. I have several people in, in my extended family that suffer from bipolar. And so over the years, you kind of, as you learn what your parents or family have a history of, and you and I have spoke about this, about you know having some type of tool that yeah. the family can log into to see the history of uh, family, uh, maybe diseases, um, what they died of, uh, whatever, you know, surgeries, that kind of thing. That way you would know to tell your doctor, yeah, my family has a history of this. And so yeah. mental health is no different. Uh, I don't think I suffer from bipolar. Definitely have not thrown TVs through windows before, uh, but the day is young. So you never know, Joshua, you never know. Um, uh, how, so a role of the family and friends, <clears throat> um, how loved ones can support men overcoming these barriers, encouraging them to seek help. I do think that, you know, uh, with family, Sometimes people tend to like, just walk that off, that type yeah. of mentality. You don't have that. I've known you for X number of years. You're just trying to get attention, yada, yada. So I think it's important for if you are trying to turn to someone in your family, choose wisely or find someone outside your family that may be a little bit more open to listening um, if you're going to do that, I think it's important to be real. Don't make up stuff. Don't try to be, uh, don't play the victim card. If you have something, talk about it. If you don't, don't elaborate on it just to get attention. Yeah. And, um, uh, so our, our verse around this is Joshua 1, 9 says, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, but the Lord, your God will be with you wherever you go. And I think what draws to that one was don't be discouraged. Yeah. You know, dealing with mental health, it's not like um, you could just hit a switch and it goes away. If you're right, I'm cured. Coping, yeah, I'm cured, right. Um, this is why coping mechanisms run rampant because you start, say, drinking to offset your your life and what it is and what it's not. And you realize once you sober up, 
you start thinking about that again. So, well, that means that's just a constant barrage of alcohol or drugs or whatever it is to help you cope with that mental illness. And so um, Joshua 1 9 talks about not being discouraged. So um, we can really go into our second segment on the other side of this break here you'll see a couple of sponsors some advertisers that partner with uncommon uh, they get a range of uh, time and feature from us with their um, support their financial support and if you would like to be one of these please let us know visiting uncommon.org today so check out our our sponsors and we'll see you on the other side Uncommon would like to thank today's sponsor, Wilson Technology Group. At Wilson Technology Group, we're not just an IT vendor. We're your trusted business partner delivering exceptional support, innovative solutions, and peace of mind. One call, one team. All your tech issues resolved. Welcome back to our second segment of our mental health podcast. I was talking about mental health to, uh, this month and this segment is called mental health and masculinity and so the topic is traditional views of masculinity can be negative impact on a man's mental health and their willingness to seek help and so uh ha again gen x generation we grew up with arnold schwarzenegger Chuck Norris, Stallone, uh, John Claude Van Damme, all, all mm. these people that, you know, John Wayne is probably a little bit older, you know, a little bit, yeah. and, but all these masculine men that like, you know, set the tone of, you know, hardness and grit and toughness and all that. And so when guys would kind of compare themselves to, these unrealistic movie characters right uh, they would not stack up very well and so it would cause issues uh even in their own lives of do i not stack up being a man and so the, the male ego is as frail as a woman's hair right i mean uh Women's self-esteem about their hair and their appearance are very, very fragile. Men's ego is very fragile. Mm -hmm. I mean, this if it wasn't comb over, comb overs would not exist, right? Two pays would not exist. And so um have you ever had something that you saw and said, that's a good example of masculinity? Or that's a bad example of masculinity. I'm gonna go with the churchy answer here with the good masculinity. And right. I mean, the Bible is full of men that God called to overcome their shattered egos and their you know mental health issues or physical deformities. Yeah. I think it's interesting that you bring up the idea of like the traditional masculinity norms that were brought up in movies when you were growing up and and prior to that because. That was just kind of like the gateway drug for what we talked about in the previous podcast about social media right. and how if you want to find guys who are, you know, have eight packs and, you know, gorgeous bombshell wives and have, you know, millions of dollars in cash that they're like rolling around in their bedroom, you can find that online and compare yourself and feel very small. And you know, a lot of that stuff can trigger into like depression and you know that self-worth just being destroyed because you're like well well am i not a good uh, am i not a good provider since i'm not i don't have a mansion for me and my kids or do, do i fail in my job because i don't have a mustang or you know a lamborghini or whatever um so i think it, it's there are way more bad examples of masculinity that you can compare yourself to out there than good ones and i think it's 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 one of those things where uh, the dangers of social media and even just movies and, and media in general if you let the the writers and these people that airbrush these creatures of masculinity uh in front of you and you compare yourself to them you're going to have a bad day 
Yeah. Um, so it's it's really important to really focus on what the Bible says about masculinity and, you know, what God has called us to be as leaders and, you know, heads of the household, because that's a bar that we can strive towards. Now, is that bar easy? No, never. No, at no point in the Bible does the God ever say, hey, this is going to be easy kind of thing. But at least that's a that's a plumb line that we can line ourselves up against. And we know it's it's a good it's a good bar to aim for. Uh, as opposed to Lamborghinis and, and million dollar houses. Yeah, I, I think it's important for us. You mentioned the word plumb line. Uh, you you don't know uh, a stick is crooked until you hold it up to one is not. Right? Yeah. And so uh, during this time of year, we're into football. And so um, go Saints, by the way. And so we're watching TV and this is the only time of year that we get chance to see commercials, everything else. We always stream and do not have to watch commercials <laughs> and watching commercials this time of year. I'm always taken aback to see how much garbage there is on network television. Mm -hmm. uh, these reality shows, which they never run out of, of this stupid idea, this stupid thing. Um, and what's interesting is when they're trying to sell that show to you, they overdo it so much. The, the buzz clips mm -hmm. uh, of the, the drama of it, the magical nature of it. Oh my God, I cannot believe see so-and-so react to the mundane today. At mm -hmm. Uh, it is crazy to see how hard they try to sell something that is not the best for us. And, you know, I have not seen most of these shows, if not all of them, but I'm very familiar with reality TV and seeing people's dysfunction on display. This is kind of like people tune into an ass car and watch car wreck, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff gets us to tune in you know, uh, good examples of, um, uh, masculinity, um, couples, anything in between, you know, uh, life, kids kind of thing. It's almost like nowadays that's boring. You know, that, that's so boring. Where's the drama? Right. So, you know, when we look at, they call it toxic masculinity. I mean, I think it's, Anything toxic could be applied to any of these roles, yeah. but uh, that thinking could be, I'm not a real man if I need help in be mental health, or uh, maybe I use anger to deal with my mental issues. And so uh, starting to speak about this with family and friends and not turning to what's on TV as a result, uh, we always say, the only inspired word of God is the Bible, is scripture, nothing else, no book written, no podcast, no website, nothing else is the inspired word of God. Start there. And so when we look at other things to help justify or um, maybe discourage ourselves from a mental health standpoint, there's just so much at our fingertips that is bad for us and there, there's just no solution um in a lot of the mediums that we take part in you know yeah. virtual you know web tv all that kind of stuff um and so we're trying to focus on a little bit on masculinity and christian values here so aligning the concept of masculinity with christian values um of of a compassion empathy and emotional honesty um are Christian men manly men? And I would say absolutely. You know, the world may look at a Christian man and say, that's a weak person that, you know, um, good guys finish last. Um, uh, I can do more by, you know, like uh, maybe cheating or looking out for myself or whatever. I do not need that and say they kind of look at a christian man as maybe sometimes a bit less of a man mm. and so um but you touched on some great 
topics of there are all kinds of examples of men of the Bible that were very manly. You know, Samson wasn't always a great example of mm. a godly man, but he was definitely manly. Uh, David killed Goliath. Um, you, know, you had Moses, you know, leading a million plus Israelites. That's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. Joshua as well. You have all these people, Paul, that all went through some horrific things to stick to their principles and hold on to their values. I think there are tremendous examples in the Bible um, around that. And um, I don't know, I, I, have you run into when you were in your uh, college years, did you ever run into a perspective toward Christian, let's just say Christian men from the unbelievers in your, on your campus? Not a whole lot was said in that regard. I think most I got was kind of odd looks because I was in the art program and I talked about going to Bible study and that was kind of the, the end of that because they really didn't know how to refer to that. I do think it's interesting to see the term masculinity nowadays is always paired with the word toxic. And I think that's really sad to see because then it makes it makes the idea that masculinity is a bad thing when it's not. It's not yeah. a bad thing at all. I mean, there's the Bible talks about being got men of God's word, right? And that is comes with its own things of masculinity. And to brandish everything masculine as bad, it's just insane. I mean, it's weird to see that just being into masculinity and being a gentleman and all that kind of stuff is seen as weak and bad um and it's it's sad to see that all these guys now have a lot of issues with well, where who am i what, what do i do what's my identity if i can't be a masculine man or um, be a man in general sure that's being seen as a bad thing i think it's sad to see that and i really hope we can as a culture reclaim that name in a good way eventually but i think that it's it's a dangerous road to just brandish everything like that and then like you said a lot of people view christianity as uh, christian men as weak because of the um, the emotional based words of compassion empathy grace love and i think it just shows you that what happens when you're not emotionally educated on how that works Sure. And, you know, that's a fear of, well, I don't like that. I don't like how that, I don't like how that emotion makes me feel. So I want to make you feel bad but for having it. And I want to like shove that emotion away. And, and you know, as guys, we've always kind of talked about how a lot of men, you know, have, we struggle with communicating with emotions and that, you know, edu that educated ver verbiage and, and whatnot, and how that can result in not communicating effectively and result in issues with either your spouse, other guys, just family in general. Sure. And so I think it's interesting to see, cause like, even with the men that you mentioned, talk, we talk about um, being masculine and whatnot, but even Jesus wept, you know, and it's interesting to see that there's a purpose to that. I mean, sure. it's in the Bible for a reason to show that even Jesus dealt with emotions. Sure. That level. And so, I think it's odd whenever I hear people talk about, oh man, he's so emotional as if that's a bad thing. Right. It's funny. I rarely talk about it, but I was into martial arts for about 13 years kind of thing. Um, I started very young, went through some high school years, um, attained black belt and I got as high as third degree. And the amount of time that our instructors, what we call senseis, um, would spin talking to us about not using martial arts on someone. It was not that we couldn't, in the sense of defend ourselves, um, <clears throat> just the opposite. One of the, one of the things when I became a black belt, I had to register with the police in case I hurt someone, they had that on record um sounds kind of corny but back then that was what they did mm -hmm. and so um but we were always focused on and taught to not use that 
And so I think I say that because you can kind of see that, you know, uh, we're taught as a Christian man to, like, you know, have, you know, be gentle as a dove. But I always like the part of being shrewd as a serpent. I mean, um, I would definitely err on the side of forgiveness and kindness. Um, but don't get that twisted. If we need to have intense fellowship, it will happen with the right hand of righteousness. <laughs> and so, right. you know, there's nothing wrong about being a man that is a believer in Christ. Because, you know, like you said, Jesus showed emotion. Flipping the tables with righteous anger was an emotion. And yeah. so, um, you know, there is, there is um, a sense of pride that I think God wants us to have in him. That, yes, I'm a believer in Christ. And, and it's not like, you know, I go around banging the drum, you know, trying to be prideful. But in the sense of... Uh, I want my belief in Christ to show that's something that I am proud of and I'm not ashamed of and do not hide. And so when someone thinks of a, a believer, a man, as something less, uh, I, I do think that is an injustice and we should not let that get into our heads. Um, our, our verse in this segment here ends with Ephesians 4.2 with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And so when you read that, you might think this guy's a pushover kind of thing. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I never I never got the feeling that when we read about Jesus, or even the disciples in the Bible, that these were anything less than men. Yeah. You know, they were never like, you know, you know, uh, weak in nature or um, timid or uh, just less than, I think that they were always you know, referred to as men of God, not not boys of God or anything else, men of God. So um, that's our second segment. Be sure to stay tuned for our last segment for the podcast uh, focused on mental health. If you like this podcast, uh, be sure to subscribe. Uh, we do a lot of short form content from our long form podcast, and we have a ton of content and resources on uncommon.org from uh, weekly blog articles, originals, workbooks, ebook studies, masterclass pieces, videos, podcasts. I'm sure I'm forgetting something, Joshua. The devotions, over 75 plus devotions on version, as well as the website. So if you like some of this content, we had this in a ton more on uncommon.org. In the meantime, we'll see you on the other side. Uncommon, we'd like to thank today's sponsor, Viking Mergers. Sell your business? Viking Mergers and Acquisitions can help. With 25 plus years of experience and 800 successful sales, we're experts in securing maximum value. Get your free business valuation now at vikingmergers.com or call 866-592-9467. Hey guys, welcome back. We are wrapping up this episode with the final segment on mental health. Uh, for this podcast, we're going to be talking about building resilience and some good coping strategies when it comes to dealing with mental health and just what it means to be a, a man in today's culture. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be talking about a lot of biblical examples here in a little bit. Um, but one that always comes to my mind here is Job and the craziness that he goes through in the Bible of just like suffering after suffering after suffering of like when you just don't think it can get worse and it gets worse. Um, I think it's a great story and showcasing a life that resilience is not something that everyone has, but we can all work towards. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't, I, I know for a fact that if I was in that situation, I would have broken well before he did, oh, uh, wow. just going through losing his, his family, his health, his, 
his financial status, like everything. Um, but holding on to his faith in God is just, it's just a true testament. And the Bible is full of these stories that we can look towards and read and, and draw inspiration from that, you know, we are not alone in these situations. And I think to me, I always take away the fact that in most of these situations, if not all of them, there is someone in that person's life, either person, angel, or God themselves, mm -hmm. that they lean on and talk through and get help with. Very rarely is it someone who like, yep, I did it by myself and I'm walking away kind of thing, scot free. Um, and I think that's kind of re reinforces what we've been talking about for most of this mental health series of seeking guidance from those around us, as well as prayer and reading the Bible. The so. staggering mental assault on Job, I think, is kind of lost. And we're so focused on the physical and the tangible nature of his loss but the Definitely. mental assault was staggering and as we go through these people like so the next one would be joseph you know mm -hmm. uh we tend to like think about yes he was one of 12 brothers and <clears throat> sold into slavery and but we, we forget about those years in prison mm -hmm. You know, and he he had to go through some of that to get to rise in Potiphar's house and and even in authority in Egypt. I mean, I don't even want to go through, you know, 30 minutes of traffic, let alone three, three and a half years of being imprisoned wrongfully, right? So right. we look at some of these examples. Uh, not only was he falsely accused, you know, uh, but there was just so much like, you know, temptation from part of his wife or even the king about like, you know, I'm going to summon you up and read this uh, interpretation kind of thing and let me know. And then back to the prison for you for a while. It wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, do this, get out of jail. So when we're thinking about these stories and characters not made up stories you yeah. know stories for our benefit you know i'd like us all to like put ourselves a little bit in that situation to see that they have been men godly men have gone through some things that we don't even get close to and yeah. to we don't get close to that um but it may feel that way but we we don't and but there's good examples of obviously the bible is written for us not about us and mm -hmm. the perfect examples of us to look back and see what we could do to help ourselves like they help themselves yeah i think joseph is a great example of being a faith a faith ba or faithful man but also being um showing that like forgiveness and grace because <clears throat> If I was thrown into slavery and suffered for all those years by my brother, they show their faces for food. Guess who's not getting McDonald's? They're not getting <laughs> McDonald's. All right. That that would be me. I would have a very healthy grudge built up over the years of all the all the stuff I've been through. So the fact that he forgives them um and and saves his family, that that to me tells me that's a a faith that overcomes hum his human nature in every capacity, because everything and as a human would scream, pay these people back for what they've done to you. It's sure. eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of deal. And I think it's it's very, very interesting that in the example of all these these stories and the other two we're going to mention here in a minute, that when they are faithful in the end, everything else is taken away from them, their faith still remains. Sure. I think that's the powerful nature of mm. being a, a, a Christian man. Yeah, definitely. These are great examples. You know, uh, there's a ton of examples out there in today's world that are not great or just yeah. outright horrible examples. But there are there's a book and there is scripture about wonderful examples, godly examples, and we're talking about them right now. So what's the next one, Joshua? Um, so we were uh, the next one on our list here, and this is not an exhaustive list. This were just a few that we had come together uh, to talk about, but Paul, 
Um, you may know him in briefly. Sounds familiar. Yeah, um, you know, just writing so many books of the Bible and um, just the, the his life going through beatings, imprisonment, shipwrecks, just constant uh, opposition, and just his his conversion to uh, being a, a believer. Um, all through that, I mean, I I honestly don't between him and Job, I I honestly don't know who I would crumple with first if I was put in that position. But um, again, he just shows how being a man of his faith sustained him through all those different instances of heartbreak, mental anguish, physical uh, beatings and, and, and the like. And just, it's a, it's a very uplifting story of redemption is his whole life story. After, you know, you kind of think about, you know, being shipwrecked, you know, flogged, beaten, cast out of cities. Um, I mean, it would make uh, the realist in me would be like, Lord, <laughs> uh, am I doing something that you don't want me to do? Should I go someplace else kind of thing? Or why is this so difficult? You know, um, as we see, some of these guys chose to be in these situations, and some of these guys did not. Yeah. But Paul chose to be spreading the gospel and be in harm's way. Mm -hmm. Job did not. Mm -hmm. They had a conversation about Job in heaven. I do not ever want to be the topic of a conversation. <laughs> um, so the last one here is David. Before David became king, he faced several. And this goes back to what you said about Joseph. Uh, Life-threatening situations, including being constantly, actively pursued by King Saul to kill him. Mm -hmm. And he had ample opportunity to defend himself or kill Saul outright to stop him from doing that. But when he was in that cave with Saul, I, I don't know if I would have been able to like, just let it go. Yeah. He is actively trying to kill me at every turn. And so you can kind of see that these situations are extreme in nature. And while many of us don't experience this exactly, we may experience something that feels mm -hmm. as heavy as this from a mental health standpoint. And so uh, you can read about that uh, in 1 Samuel and in Psalms. Um, so those were some examples of developing resilience. Now we're moving into some coping strategies. And mm -hmm. I want to make sure we focus on healthy coping strategies. Brownies and donuts and pies and cakes are only going to get you so far in life. Even alcohol too, right? So uh, differentiating between a healthy and unhealthy coping mechanisms is huge. Mm -hmm. So things like alcohol or substance abuse. Um, like, I'm always amazed, uh, you know, we... We try. I mean, we're you know we work at a a company that we have to be aware of a lot of different industries and 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 stuff. So we got to kind of keep up to date with things. But there's things that I am totally oblivious to. Thankfully, one of them is politics, but also mm -hmm. things like the fentanyl. Um, I don't even know what that was. I had to look look it up to see what it was. I didn't know if it like stepped in it like a puddle or if it was a <laughs> pill or, or what, but you can kind of see that we have access to things, and especially when you go to a doctor with a story and a wink, and then boom, you're on some kind of like pill, mm -hmm. anxiety, whatever, and you're abusing that possibly. And so like an example would be a man feeling stressed from work starts to drink. Mm -hmm. He's to have... Uh, a couple of beers or a glass of wine to relax. And over time, that moves from an occasional drink to pounding down a 12-pack every night in the name of, I had a hard day. Yeah. Um, someone may be experiencing anxiety, um, begins using a prescription drug, maybe not even prescribed to them. Uh, or in, not in a way that was intended. It is a means to escape. It was interesting. I don't know where it came from. It was around uh, Christmas time. 
but on my social timelines, I never did a search for any of the stuff. Just kind of like, hey, we think you might want this, I guess. Um, it was, I won't even say the name of the company, but there were these uh, chewables that would, a chewable would kind of put you in a mood, right? Mm. One for relaxing, maybe one for pain, one for uh, happiness type thing. And I'm like, when in the world did, did this start? You know, yeah. and so you can kind of see that that stuff is readily available and you get someone who's always over medicated thinking that they're getting through life, but it's actually killing them as they're going through it. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting, too, is that we talked about a couple of different things here, but the, the key word here is escape. You're looking for an escape or overcoming or avoiding the the issues kind of thing and that can take these forms here it can take forms of uh i know video games is a huge escape for a lot of people reading is a huge escape for anything then in your life that can show detriment to your relationships around you that's when the issue becomes in that either your health someone else's health or or, or mental anguish that you're causing other people right sure so you know, the adage is old and it's old for a reason. It's everything in moderation, right? Um, you know, if something in your life is overtaking you to the point where you're not taking care of yourself or those around you, that's when the issue needs to be raised of, okay, is this thing healthy for me? Clearly it's not. Sure. Let's discuss why that is. And that's that's kind of the opposite side of that. So those those examples were like the unhealthy coping mechanisms. So sure. the healthier version or the healthy versions of that is talking with someone talking what you're feeling going through that process and it may not even be for i'm going to talk to you let's fix this kind of thing and just talking about the issues you're feeling the emotions yeah well, that's a trusted you know, family member a uh, friend even a therapist or even a counselor i know a lot of churches have counselors that are, are readily readily available for you to talk to and that they're there for a reason sure um, and those people can you know you can find relief in expressing those things i know that over the years as uh, me and my wife we've been married for over th three almost four years now talking through it even if it is a in inconsequential piece of information helps me understand her better and her understand me better because that person may not understand where i'm coming from if they don't know what i'm thinking sure. and Fortunately, I can't read minds. And so I need her to explain to me sometimes what she's thinking or feeling. That way I can be more conscious of how I communicate to her or talk to her and help her in how, whatever way is most beneficial to her. So I th it, it's the, it sounds like the easiest thing. And that's what the, the downside is. Talking it out sounds like an easy thing. And it's like, oh, yeah, talk it out. Yeah, move on. Be right. very clear here. Talking is hard. Sure. But it's the most beneficial thing to start with. Sure. Talking and listening, right? Talking at a person, not yeah. beneficial. Talking with a person, beneficial. Not listening when the other person is talking, not beneficial. Yeah. Listening to what they have to say while not trying to talk over them, very beneficial. Yeah. Um, so you guys have been married about, about, you said about three to four years. Almost four years this March. Uh, so mom and I have been married. We'll get ready to turn 34 years. Those two numbers are together. 34. Mm -hmm. um, and we dated for six years before that in school. And so, uh, you know what's changed between your example and my example? Nothing. <laughs> Communication is always the place to start. We don't always get it right. Um, you know, someone's in a bad mood. Someone's having a bad day whatever they're hangry uh <laughs> and the more time you spend together uh the more uh, kind of loose that conversation may get like in the sense of like well you figure well we've already had this conversation a thousand mm -hmm. times we need to have it again you do but you know, this is a whole different podcast but uh yes help having a great conversation is is wonderful um uh someone facing a very stressful situation, you know, you know, therapists, uh, they're not all like Fraser Crane, uh, but they're not all like, you know, Sigmund Freud either. So, you know, there are 
and we get we get a, a lot of of all the prayer requests we do get um they're usually 99 percent of them are focused on marriages divorces dysfunction separation we never get a prayer request of my wife and i just turned you know 34 years of marriage we have a fantastic marriage I want you to please keep us in your prayers that we keep you know god in the center of our marriage and focus on growing with each other we've never gotten that type of prayer request it is always the opposite and of course we always hear one side of the story it's that person sending the email it's right. so i think it's important for like you said talking to a trusted person therapist counselor um, your church probably has one if not look for a christian counselor or therapist uh, they will give you uh, uh, input from a biblical perspective uh, and it's, it's not always I'm not trying to bag on uh, secular therapists and counselors but I think if you had a choice I think I would focus on one that kind of knew my background and knew what made me tick and so, yeah, um, yeah in encouraging the adoption of these kind of healthy practices, uh, even, you know, some some exercises or creative hobbies help with this uh, process. You wouldn't think it'd be, but in, in light of MLK Day yesterday, Dr. King would say, if you're thinking about, if you're thinking you're going to be sinning, go plow a field. And he meant go do something active and get your mind off of sinning. Yeah. And so um, our, our next segment is talking about a few things like mindfulness and meditation. You know, a man that starts his day 10 minutes of meditation or prayer uh, helps center himself on the approaching day. You know, I spend my time, I always do my, my Bible study in the morning. I wake up and it's the first thing I do is my Bible study. Um, does it always make sure I don't have a bad day? Of course not. But it does set the tone for my day. It usually takes something else to cause that to be turned a little bit. But if I start my day with that, I think it's important. Uh, and it puts me in the most successful way possible. And, you know, during lunch breaks, um, someone practices maybe some deep breathing exercises um, to manage their work-related stress. Um, what's, what's funny is that uh, I was with someone recently, and the person was like, they said something that I didn't really want to go do. And my watch went off and said, relax. <laughs> I'm like... Uh, okay, all right. And take take a moment here. I really don't want to do that, but even my watch was telling me to relax. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think we all need to be praying and tuned in to God throughout the day. This is not like a checkbox of mm -hmm. I'm going to do my Bible study at 7 a.m. Check, and then I'm good for the day. Yeah, That doesn't work that way. I need to be focused on God as often as possible throughout that day for me to get through that day to glorify him. And so uh, the next one is exercise and physical activity, Joshua. Why don't you take that one? Yeah, I, we've talked a little bit about this with, with mentioning the MLK okay Day, um, about throwing that energy into somewhere productive. Mm -hmm. um, and not all the time you have the ability to go for a 30-minute walk or jog, but being able to um, just take yourself out of that environment, maybe where you're stewing on those emotions and mental health issues and, and sin or whatever, and getting out, doing something, using that, that energy in a productive way. I know I often take walks with the dogs and then I put a podcast in my head with some earphones or I listen to my, my, my Bible reading for the day. Um, just getting out of the environment and changing where you are often does loads of good uh, when it comes to these kind of things and being um, just mindful of, you know, your body's reaction to emotional status and mental health, because the body reacts just as easily as your mind does to these things. Um, and it's interesting to see that because 
we often talk about the mental health version of this, but also the physical body as well as the spiritual uh, health that we have um, that all kind of like linked together and, uh, you know, all work together or work against you, depending on whether you have some of these in place, whether, you know, not having a Bible study or a quiet time uh, or, you know, not being um, in the best physical state that you can be, all these kind of play off each other and can wreak havoc if not kept in check. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the endorphins that get released into the body when we're doing something physical is kind of understated, you know. And so um, after the first of the year, I'm like, you know, I'm getting back into my rowing. Well, mom and I caught COVID uh, last week of the year. And uh, God had other plans about that. Here it is the 16th, and I am nowhere near ready for the rower. But <laughs> I do think it's about a week or two away. Uh, that's my goal, at least, is to get back into that rowing. And so, uh, but yeah, I think uh, having some type of exercise, creative hobby is a great place to help. Um, you know, just going for a walk sometimes does change our mood. Yeah. So... Uh, our next section here is called Faith as a Resilience Factor. Uh, we're talking about faith and spiritual practices that can contribute building resistance and coping healthy, healthily. Um, so faith as a source, uh, a strength of hope, um, and we'll just touch lightly on these. Um, a man facing a difficult transition, uh, a life transition such as a job loss or family crisis, um, he regularly attends church uh, services, participates in prayer groups, uh, drawing comfort from the sense of community and a reassurance of God's presence in his life. I mean, that's a great way for us to have a nice, well-rounded experience that, because if you just do one of those things, the other areas of your life is going to be difficult to get mm -hmm. through. Um, I mean, we need each other to do life that's why you know we, you know do not forsake the gathering of the saints right he wants yeah. us to do life together to help each other where one's strength or strong other one's weak and vice versa yeah uh someone diagnosed with a chronic illness turns to their faith for comfort and understanding uh they engage in a personal prayer uh, and reading scripture finding passages that speak to endurance and hope during times of trial that right there is probably one of the best descriptions of uncommon. When we're developing content, we're trying to think of, well, what we struggle with, what would help us as a resource, and some of the input we get from guys uh, on social or prayer requests or just in life in general. And so when we're trying to develop content, it is around um, focusing on topics that resonate as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, so as we kind of wrap this up, uh, our verse uh, here is Romans 5, 3 through 4. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, <clears throat> and character produces hope. Unfortunately, we can't always see those things happening, but um, knowing that suffering produces those things, we can we can rejoice. I think yeah. Paul showed a great example of that. You know, even Peter and Paul when they were in the prison. Um, Paul, when he was in all his situations, um, I mean, there are guys who were in bad situations, in a lion's den, in the fiery furnace, in the belly of the whale. There are areas that are very hard to show rejoice, rejoice yeah. that these are why we read the, the scripture. So, yeah. so give us our challenge, Joshua. So this challenge uh, for this week, we are going to, as, as a group, ourselves included, identify one area of our lives where we have uh, an unhealthy coping strategy, strategy in place in our lives and replace it with a healthy one, such as uh, a quiet time in the Bible prayer or a Bible study group, or even uh, possibly finding a therapist and meeting with them, as well as finding areas in our life where we can build resilience through those activities. So picking one, just one, all you gotta do is one, 
and then finding ways to improve upon that using the list of things that we talk about in this podcast, as well as the resources on the website. Yeah, like I said before, uh, Uncommon has a ton of resources. Uh, and we've been doing this for just over 11 years. So we have a lot in the tank. Um, from a library standpoint, I think we have almost everything someone could be going through other than murder. Um, uh, I don't think we've done anything on murder <laughs> when it comes to developing content, but I think we've done everything in between that. And uh, so uh, if you need uh, resources, please check us out at uncommon.org. We have a we have a great membership program that unlocks a ton more resources than what comes with free. So there's a lot that's free, but the membership uh, platform, whether it be monthly, annual, or a lifetime, they unlock probably double, if not triple, the content that we offer and mm -hmm. resources. So be sure to check us out at uncommon.org. And so as we wrap this up, we hope you guys have a great um, January, great mental health month, and we will see you in our next podcast. And if you're going to be something, be uncommon. <laughs>